So my name is Arun Gupta. And I'm Fabienne Nardon. All right, so today we will talk about Docker for Java developers specifically. How many of you are Java developers in your day job? Well, that makes sense, you know, pretty much the entire room, you know, so I guess we are in the right audience then. Well, I'm a Java champion. I, I'm from Brazil, actually, um, and I work for a company that does data science in Java using Docker, Hadoop, and this kind of stuff. So hope, hopefully I can share a little bit of my experience here. Uh, my name is Arun Gupta. I'm a Docker captain. I'm also a Java champion. I like to run. I'm getting ready for my first ultra marathon in June, so I'm pretty excited about that. Um, in addition, um, um, I'm always looking for new tips and tricks, you know, what people are telling me. So often I give this talk, I end up learning a lot more from the attendees after the Q&A and all those things. So, yeah. So what we plan to cover. Um, this is sort of our broader agenda that we are looking to cover. We'll talk about when you're building your, packaging your Java applications, what is the base image that we need to use. We'll talk about, as a Java developer, you use Maven or Gradle, one of those build tools. We'll talk about exactly how do you use those tools to package your Java application, run your containers. We'll talk about how can you do multi-container application. Your application typically consists of multiple containers, a database container, a web container, an application container, a caching layer, and multiple instances of those. So we'll talk about how do you run multi-container application on a single host for development and multiple hosts for production. We'll talk about scaling apps on AWS or Azure. Yeah, we are going to talk also about memory man management for Java applications running in Docker. That's a little tricky. And we are going to show how to debug your Java applications, how to monitor your Java applications in Docker, and how to do integration testing. So pretty much everything that you care about from your Java application perspective, but with a Docker paint on it so that you understand how does my life change you know, as a Java developer, particularly when I'm building my applications with Docker. So let's get started, jump right in. Well, when you build a Java, when you build a Docker image, you need a base image. What are my options for using the base image for Java? Well, the first one you know, that people have been using for a very long time is Java. Um, kind of very logical, intuitive name. How many of you are still using Java as a base image? Very good. I'm glad nobody is, because that is deprecated as of December 31st, 2016. So if you are using, please don't. Tell your friends not to use that as a base image. It is getting, still getting updates, but any point of time, they'll pull the plug on it. Nobody will be updating that image. So think about JDK 8 builds, JDK 9 builds, all of that good stuff that you care about will not be available in that base image. So, but that's, that was the start. So what do you do then? Well, you use OpenJDK as the base image. That is the base image that you wanna use. That is the image which is basically renamed from Java, basically tagged from Java and now is OpenJDK. That is getting all the latest updates. So this is a snapshot from uh, Docker Hub. So you can look at the tags, all the latest tags, all the eight tags, nine tags, all different variety versions, everything is over there. Now, you can look at a Debian-based image or an Alpine-based image. Uh, you can look at the JDK image or a JRE image. You know, if you saw, were in the keynote this morning, you saw a demo of how you can use a multi-stage build to be more effective. So think about using a JDK image for building your application, and then the second stage is where you're using a JRE to package your application. That'll keep your all the, you know, your compilation files, all your JDK, all the everything else you need, your Maven artifacts, exclude from the build. Use only the jar file and you know, your JRE as the base image, kind of makes it simple. And further cut, it, cut down your image size if you can deal with the Alpine image. What is the difference? I mean, if you look back for a second, you know, between Debian and Alpine, it's almost three times the size. So what is it that is not available in the Alpine image? So you gotta be aware of that. Um, it shows you a snapshot of what all you are missing out from the Alpine image. Essentially, it's a non-essential stuff. You know, I mean, I hope you know, there are probably a handful of people who are probably still using Corba. So that kind of utilities is what they have cut down. You know, if you're using JavaFX, then you may care about this. So essentially, it kind of gives you a snapshot of if you're using an Alpine-based JDK image, what is it that you're not getting? It's important to know that. What is the third option? Well, I use Oracle JDK. You know, how do I use that as a base image? Now, 
you can't create an image, use Oracle JDK as a base image. First of all, there is no Oracle JDK base image. You can't create an image, you know, put Oracle JDK in there and push it to Docker Hub. That's a violation of legal license from Oracle's perspective because it's a supported product. It's a product because you accept the license when you download JDK, so you can't push that image to Docker Hub. So what is your option? Oracle Container Registry in that sense. Oracle Container Registry uh, essentially is Oracle uh, Container Registry dot, well, Container Registry dot Oracle dot com. If you go to that URL, you can sign up for an account, and that's where you can download the official Oracle images. Well, I don't want to go that route. I have my custom JDK where I've added some tweaks, some tunes, all that kind of stuff. So where do I host my specific images? Um, I still want to use my JDK. I have my support contract and stuff like that. So in that case, what you do is you do create your custom image, but then you put it on a private repository. So for example, ECR. You know, so you can use uh, Amazon EC2 container registry. You create your own image and you push the image over there, but then it's a managed service. You don't care about you know, how the registry is being running, but your image is sitting over there. And then you are controlling the access. It's not publicly available, hopefully. And last but not the least, you know, the fifth option that I would recommend is look at Zulu. So, you know what, I don't have support contract. I'm looking for an image to get started with. You know, I, all I want is a supported commercial JDK image that is available on Docker Hub. I don't have time to set up ECR. I don't have time to set up my registry. I just want a commercially supported image. So as um, companies like Azul and similarly IBM, they have supported version of JDK that are available on Docker Hub. So that's sort of your one of the options. So the key part that I want you to think about is, when you are using the base image, do you really want JDK? Is there any compilation happening at the runtime? Because that's gonna add a bloat to your application. Right away, your image size goes like big. So highly encourage you to use the multi-stage build process, where in the first stage, you're using JDK to compile your application, and the second stage, you just pick the jar and use JRE as the base image. So that's something to keep in mind. All right, now we understood what the base images look like. Now I am a Java developer. As a Java developer, I am building my applications either using Maven or Gradle, or well, possibly Ant, maybe shell script, or maybe hand compilation, hopefully not. But Maven and Gradle are the two popular build systems, at least from the Java developer's perspective. So let's take a look at it. When I'm using those as build systems, what tools are available to me? What plugins are available to me to have a more seamless integration? First of all, in terms of Maven plugins, there are a few varieties of Maven plugins that are available. There is one by Spotify, one by Fabricate team. My preference is the one by the Fabricate team. Um, and the reason my preference is that because first of all, this is by Red Hat, which is in there very much in their open source is their DNA, very actively maintained. That's the plugin that they use for their OpenShift platform as well. And the quality and the feature is pretty rich. The community is very responsive. And I know the maintainers one-on-one -on -one as well. But essentially, what you do is you add this as a plugin in your Palm XML. And then you have a bunch of goals available to you. You can um, start a container. You can stop a container. You can build an image. You can push, push an image to a Docker hub. So your typical Docker lifecycle commands are available to you as part of your Maven lifecycle itself. How does my Palm XML change? So here is my Maven configuration file here. So I mean, if I can walk you through this a little bit, essentially what line 64 through 66 is showing how my plugin configuration looks like. Well, that's my plugin definition essentially. Then line 67 through 85 is my plugin configuration. And the plugin configuration essentially has, uh, if you think about it, it's got an image part. Well, it says what images need to be built. Within images, you can say, what is my one image? Now within image, I got three parts. I'm saying what is my image name, which is my repository name essentially. Then I got a build section, which is how I'm gonna build my image. And then I got a run section, which is sort of my run part of it. So essentially, if you have multiple images to build, you can specify all of them over there. The one key line that I want to highlight over here is line 74, where I'm saying artifact. What that means is, as part of Maven package, I have possibly generated a jar or a war file. All I'm telling Maven is, go ahead, pick that jar file, and add it to my base image, Now, whatever the base image is. Now in this case, 
and line 72, I'm specifying OpenJDK as a base image, but I could use whatever base image I want to use. And now in this case, I'm also specifying the Docker configuration, Docker file configuration in the POM XML. Certain times, what you may want is, here is my Docker file, use that Docker file instead. That's perfectly fine. So all those configurations are entirely possible. And then finally, in your POM XML itself, you can say how I'm going to associate those goals that are available to me to different Maven phases. So for example, in this case, I'm saying every time I say Maven package, which is on line 89, do the build. So you just say Maven package, possibly in a profile, like say Docker profile that you create in Maven. And the moment you say Maven package, it's going to build the image for you. And when you say Maven install, it's going to run the container for you, and it's going to spit out the logs as well. Now, this is completely up to you. The point being, you have a Docker Maven plugin by Fabricate T. It has all the goals available to you. You can certainly extend the goals and attach them to different phases of Maven. And by the way, if you look at the bottom of the screen, there is a Docker Java sample from my GitHub repo that has this entire Maven file, a fully functional sample that you're welcome to use. Similar thing, you know, we have available in the Gradle world. So just like Maven, you know, there's Gradle is another build tool, and as part of that build tool, there is a Gradle plugin. Now, again, just like Maven, there are a few varieties of Gradle plugin, but my preference here is the Beamushko uh, Gradle Docker plugin. Uh, 3.06 was the latest release, um, I think about three weeks back. That's when I built these slides, essentially. Uh, you can find the details, which is shown at the GitHub URL at the bottom of here. The documentation is pretty thorough. Uh, it was started by Brian Mushko, but now there are other maintainers of the plugin. But essentially, the plugin comes in two flavors. It has a general purpose Docker remote API, where you know whatever you want to do with Docker is available to you. It's like invoking the Docker remote API, full blown API is available to you. However you want to invoke it, that's completely a possibility. So in that case, it gives you commands like Docker X image. I want to build an image, I want to push an image, I want to remove an image. So your lifecycle commands are available. Similarly for container, I want to start a container, stop a container, kill a container, all those lifecycle commands are available to you. Or for Java, what I prefer is there is an opinionated Java application plugin. Hey, you know what, that's far too much details for me to figure out where my host is running, what plugin I want to use. I'm just going to use a, a Java uh, application plugin where all I'm saying is, here is my base image, here is my image tag, and here is a port I want to expose. Just go ahead make the image for me, okay? Let's take a look at sample. Now, in this, I'm showing you a build.gradle file here. I'm, of course, adding my dependencies. Say, this is my um, Brian Mushko Gradle Docker plugin. Um, on line 13, well, line 12, first of all, I'm applying the application plugin. On line 13, I'm saying, I wanna use not the Docker remote plugin, or remote um, plugin here. I'm using a Docker Java application plugin. That's sort of the opinionated plugin that I was talking about earlier. I'm importing um, some uh, classes here. And then line 30 to 35 is where my magic is happening. So see, what, did, what does it mean to be an opinionated? All you're saying is essentially, I'm gonna build a Java application and make a Docker image for me for this. My base image is OpenJDK and tag is Hello Java. That's it, as simple as that. And in addition, I've also added a couple of custom tasks like create container and start container. And start container task, which is on line 42, depends upon create container. So I can just say start container, it'll start the container, but before that it'll create the container. So very fine granular control is available to you from Gradle perspective. All right, so that's my, and by the way, the URL that I showed earlier, that's got both the Maven sample and the Gradle sample that you're happy to look at. Let's take a look at multi-container application. As I said earlier, when you are building your application at that point of time, you need to have an you know, uh, application server, like a Wildfly, or a database server like MySQL, Couchbase, whatever database comes to your mind. Then you know, a web server, and then a caching layer. And typically, what you want is, you don't want a single instance of an application server, a single point of failure. You want multiple instances of that. Similarly with others, database is set up in a cluster. So pretty much from the start itself, when you're building your application, it's a multi-container application. Let's see what Docker offers us in that space. Well, there's of course Docker Compose. So what Docker Compose gives us is an ability to define and run multi-container applications. Your configuration can be defined in one or more files. 
the default file name in that case is docker compose dot yaml and that's where you define you know what my uh, docker compose version is you can define what your services look like and I'll show you a syntax for that one in addition you can also have a docker compose dot override dot yaml which will override the services defined in docker compose dot yaml this is very useful particularly in cases where it, whether you want to go in production or in dev or in staging well, the fun part is you can use dash F to specify as many Docker Compose YAML files. And what that brings you is the ability to say, I'm gonna use a combination of these files and then define whether a particular Docker Compose is targeted at dev or staging or production. And then accordingly, I can spin up my environments and shut down my environments. It's a single command to manage all services. And it's very good for reducing the impedance mismatch between dev, staging, and CI. Fabini, I think you found something useful as part of this. Yeah, yeah. So can you go to the next slide? Oh, well, so let's talk about this a little bit. Well, this is sort of the syntax here. It's a multi-container on single host, all I'm showing is. The beauty of Docker is whatever works on a single host would scale to multiple hosts as well. But essentially what I'm showing here is I got a Docker Compose file in that I got a web service, which is on line 10, and then I got a database service, which is on line three. And all I'm saying is, hey, bring up this web service, which is a, Wildf which is a Java EE application deployed in Wildfly container, and make it talk to a Couchbase instance, which is defined by uh, image on line four. Now, how do these containers talk to each other, really? Well, all I'm doing is, in my web service, I'm defining a couch-based URI environment variable that is then pointing to my DB service, and that's the logical connection. It's a late binding, and when the late binding happens, you know, it figures out the IP address. That is very important. You don't want to hard code a IP address because the container dies here, and if it's running as a swarm service, it's gonna come up on a different host and possibly be assigned a different IP address. You may scale the service, so there may be multiple containers running behind the scene. So that logical connection to the service is fundamentally important. Now you can run multiple files. So for example, I have this file docker compose db.yaml, okay? And this, what I'm doing is, I'm saying the port, instead of mapping 8080 on the host to 8080 in the container, I'm mapping port 80 on the host to 8080 on the container. And in addition, the image that I'm using is not Couchbase image, which is for development, but I'm using Couchbase colon prod. And what that gives me is the ability to say, hey, by the way, this is a production certified image and possibly from my private repository. But let's take a look. If I say Docker Compose, you know, I probably have a Docker Compose YAML sitting somewhere. Uh, if I say Docker Compose F, Docker Compose .yaml and Docker Compose DB .yaml, now, instead of my application coming up on port 8080 will come up on port 80 automatically. Um, I can um, look, look at the list of services by doing, giving the same command by PS. And then similarly, I can shut down the services as well. So this is a very useful feature. This is essentially what we are seeing customers using a lot for cutting down the impedance mismatch between dev, staging, and production, and literally using a combination of files. This is a very powerful feature of Docker Compose. There are other functionalities like how you can extend. You can define, for example, your AWS secret and access keys in a configuration file. And then in your Docker Compose, you can say, go extend from that file so that you don't have to repeat those access keys and secrets in all the files. That, make, that makes it really powerful. So Arun, let me show you how you, this can really change your life as a Java developer. So we've been using Docker for quite some time and we built several images for all the database, Hadoop, Spark, everything we needed. It's a very complex application. So when we started building our images, what we did was a readme file, like probably most of the early beginners did, with all the instructions on how to start each of the images. So and somebody was actually going through the readme file, yeah. running these scripts one by one. One manually. by one. And changing the paths because each developer that created a new image would put their own path. So I know this looks really stupid, but it, this is old, right? It's stupid now by the time it makes sense. So with Docker Compose, this is the new version. You can have 
exactly the same thing you had in the readme file, but uh, in a Docker Compose file, and then you can just say Docker Compose up, and all your services are going to start in the right, with the right volume mapping, ports, and everything. So what happens then, before, we would take at least four hours to have the whole environment set, if you're lucky. Now, in two minutes, we have everything set up, even if you're not lucky. So, so I guess Docker Compose does make it everybody lucky yes, in that sense. of course. All right, that was the part where we were talking about running multi-container applications on a single host. You know, how do we get multi-host you know, applications? Because single host, again, is a single point of failure. How do I extend that? Well, that's where swarm mode comes in. Uh, swarm mode was a feature that was introduced in Docker 1.12. Um, you know, if you're using, starting new with Docker, you don't need to worry about it. It's just a feature baked into Docker itself, but essentially it's, it's a native clustering in Docker itself. Um, once you set up Docker, it's an optional feature. Once you enable swarm mode, then you, know, you can use your Docker CLI to create your applications, deploy your apps, and manage your swarm, and all that capability. The beauty of this is, this is no single point of failure, because it's a multi-host Docker now. You know, your applications are scattered across different Docker hosts. It's a declarative state of model, in the sense you say, I wanna create a service, and for that service, I wanna run three replicas. And that's it, that's all you care about. If the container goes down, you bring up a new container, not my problem. So Docker is owning that responsibility that I will make sure whatever your desired needs are, I'll take care of fulfilling them. It is very self-organizing, self-healing in that sense because it makes sure that your state is maintained and if the container does go down, it'll bring up on a different host. Now go back to what I was saying earlier, why is it important to use that logical service name? Because if a container does go down, and if it comes up on a different host, a different IP address, you don't want your application to be break. It's all about the application resiliency, essential. Uh, it also has the capabilities for service discovery, load balancing, scaling. So if you scale your service from three tasks to like say six tasks, you're still using the logical name and it will automatically do the load balancing behind the scene for you. It also has the capability for rolling updates. So everything and anything that you will typically expect from you know, uh, any deployment architecture for an you know, orchestration framework is available out of the box here. So I created a six node cluster here. You know, the way swarm mode works is there is a manager, one manager, at least one manager, which is a yellow box in the center, and I have a six node, uh, five nodes, which are worker nodes essentially, uh, in the yellow, uh, in the orange here actually. Now in that cluster, I am giving a command pointing to the manager that Docker service create. So create my service. One of the things that you want to understand is as part of Docker 113, up until Docker 113, the CLI was pretty messed up. You know, the commands were very non-intuitive. In 113, all the commands have been nicely organized. So I can say Docker command subcommand, and all those subcommands are very nice. So for example, I can say Docker image ls. I can say Docker container ls. So your you have a high level command and a second level subcommand. So in this case, I'm saying Docker service create, I want three replicas, give the service a name, web in this case, and the image. And Docker automatically does the scheduling for you. So that is pretty cool. And it's a replicated service. There is another mode in Docker swarm by which you can say, create a global service. So I want a single instance. Say for example, I want a Prometheus container running on each node and only a single instance. So you can run it as a global service as well, in which case you just specify the mode as global. So multi-container or multiple hosts, how would you do that? Well, this morning you saw the example of Docker stack deploy. Now you could use a stack.yaml, but you can also use the original docker compose.yaml that we had, which we can just use right here itself. So in this case, all I'm saying is docker stack deploy, and I'm saying take my exact same compose file from one host to multiple hosts. And the logical service name is still very relevant. So that's the importance, that's the beauty of how the whole thing works from a single host to multiple hosts. Now it doesn't matter where your multiple hosts are. If your multiple hosts are configured using Docker machine, sure, it'll work there. If multiple hosts are on AWS, that'll work too. I wanna scale my service, so I can just say Docker service scale, give the service name and the number of replicas, and that's about it. All right, I've done so far development on my machine. How I'm gonna scale these services up on AWS and Azure? 
Now, if you think about Docker from a high-level high perspective, Docker comes with a CE, which is a community edition, and EE, which is an enterprise edition. Now, CE is for development purpose. Comes on, like, say, laptops, which is either Windows or Mac, or on servers, which are like Linux, or on cloud, AWS and Azure primarily. And similarly, there is a, uh, Docker for EE, which is on servers, which is a commercial offering with a 30-day evaluation version, on servers, which is Linux flavor, or on cloud, once again, on AWS and Azure. So AWS and Azure was, for the longest time, only in development and beta mode, but now it's ready for production. But essentially, what you can do is, you can use Docker for AWS or Azure, which is nothing but a cloud formation template on AWS. So you can say, here is a cloud formation template. Go, I mean, Docker has created the cloud formation template. So you just fire up the cloud formation template, but as part of that, you specify how many managers, how many workers need to be created. They are already into an auto-scaling group. So from your perspective, if a node goes down, Docker will, or actually Amazon infrastructure will bring it back up. So that number of nodes, you know, if the node gets kicked out or gets bounced, it will automatically be taken care of. Your services can be connected to ELB, or Elastic Load Balancer, and they can be load balanced that way. Your images can be stored on EBS, or your persistent volumes could be stored on EBS. So it's very well integrated in that sense with, you know, your Amazon infrastructure, if that's what you care about. Same thing on Azure as well. Now it's very well integrated with VM scale sketch. So you have auto scaling, Azure load balancer, Azure storage. So in that sense, what you're getting is a native cloud experience for the cloud platform, as opposed to making you learn a new technology here. Um, and as I said earlier, it is available both in Docker CE and Docker EE. Okay, um, memory management for Java applications. Um, so I have a few examples for you here um, and how this can be tricky. So I created uh, a, my Docker, I set the one gigabyte of memory for, for my Docker here. And you see that I'm running this command, uh, the free tool from Linux, there's no Java in it, just called free. And I, I passed the memory switch over there. That's a Docker switch. And you can see that I gave to this container 500 megabytes, right? But why I can see here that free is saying that I have one gigabytes of memory? That's because, as you know, Docker relies on control groups to do its magic, and free is a tool that was created before control groups. So free is not aware of control groups, so it thinks that the whole memory available is actually the memory I gave to Docker. So it doesn't matter if I put the memory switch over there or not. So guess which other old tool was created before control groups yet and does the same thing? It's the Java VM, right? So if I, I created a demo uh, that was just allocating memory in Java and uh, printing how, how much memory was free and use it. And you can see that I'm running this application and with the memory switch of 100 megabytes, right? So my whole Docker environment has one giga, but I'm giving just 100 uh, megabytes to, the, to this container here. And this container is running in Java. So you, you can see here that what's happening is that I'm running the application, it's allocating memory, and in the end, I have uh, the application killed by Docker. So what's happening here? So first thing, when you say, when you, when you pass the memory switch, what you are saying is that Docker should kill the application if it goes over the memory you are allocating. So uh, when the, the Java application allocates more than 100 gig, gig, uh, megabytes, it should be killed by Docker, and it's killed by Docker. Now, uh, why I don't have out of memory exceptions here? That's because the Java VM thinks that it has the whole Docker memory. So you can see that the total memory here is 253 megabytes. That's because when you don't set the heap space for Java, the default is to use 25% of the whole memory. So I have one giga for Docker, Java, the Java VM thinks 
that it can use 253 megabytes here. It doesn't matter the memory switch I, I, I put over there. And another thing that is interesting, as you can see in the used uh, print over there, that the Java VM is actually capable of allocating more than 100, gigabyte, uh, 100 megabytes. And that's because when you set the memory switch for Docker, it means RAM plus swap. So it can actually uh, allocate more memory before it's queued. But the problem here with Java applications is that if you start getting queued, uh, queued applications without out of memory exceptions, you're going to chase this bug forever and you don't know what's happening, right? So what you can do is besides setting the RAM and swap, we can do this. So this is my Maven build and you can see in the line 62 that I created a Java options variable over there. So if I do this, what I can do is when I start the application, I can put the memory switch for Docker, but I also can put my Java options and set my heap space. So now when I execute the application, if it, there's out of memory, it's going to, to give me an out of memory exception before uh, Docker actually kills the Java application. So that's the, the right way to do it. So, by default, the container is going to use as much memory and swap that is available. It doesn't matter, doesn't matter the memory switch that you're using. You can, you can restrict the memory using this Docker switch. So memory is how much memory can be allocated before Docker should queue the application. Memory reservation is more like a soft limit and memory sw swap is how much swap can be done uh, by Docker also, by the container. So, right now, the JDK is completely unaware of these limited re resources uh, for memory, also for, for CPUs, but for JDK 9, there is an experiment, is a feature that has been done, they are ex experimenting with it, and then the Java, the JDK will support control groups. So this should solve this problem. But right now, the only thing you can do is to set your, your, um, your memory for the JDK uh, as compatible with the, the, the memory you're giving to the container. Right. So the bug in Java applications, um, this is a feature that is it's very important uh, for us because when, when you are debugging an application that is inside Docker, you are debugging an application that is very close to the production environment, right? Uh, so usually when you're debugging the code that's running your, your own machines, you can reproduce errors like uh, network connections, uh, database connection problems, and things like that. But you have your, if you have your application running inside a, a Docker environment, you can simulate something that's very close to production. So the way to, to debug applications running inside Docker so you remember that I had the Java options uh, variable in my POM for, for Maven over there. So if I have that, I can start my Docker application uh, uh, exposing the 505, 5005 port and using the E switch to start this in debug mode. So when I start this, what is gonna happen is that application is going to stop waiting for an IDE or a debugger to connect to it, and then you can debug your application. So this is how you do it on NetBeans. You just attach the IDE to that port over there, and then you can debug your Java application inside Docker and uh, catch all those bugs with database connections, network, and everything that's really hard uh, to catch when you're doing uh, 
outside from, from the production environment? Well, in this case, we are using NetBeans, but by no means is restricted to NetBeans. Sure, sure. Yeah. NetBeans is our favorite IDE, which is a yes. different thing. But yes. now, yesterday, we had somebody in the workshop be able to use Eclipse, for example, yeah. for debugging as well. Eclipse idea, any IDE you want, uh, as, as long as it's able to connect to this port to do remote debugging, it's OK. So to monitor Java applications, so Docker has several command line uh, tools that can help you see what's happening inside your application, inside your, your container. The first one is Docker stats. That's going to give you the C CPU, memory, usage, and uh, all the basic monitoring uh, data that you need. Another one is the Docker remote API that you can actually connect to your, your services and see what's happening over there. It's going to give you a, a JSON response as a result. And yesterday in the workshop, there are people that are uh, thinking on using this API to do several other more advanced stuff. So uh, you can, for example, uh, check if a service is running inside Docker and then use this to decide what to do with your application. For example, wait for a database that's coming up or something like that. So I think the key part here is the Docker CLI is just a dumb client. And essentially you say Docker image build or Docker container run, whatever command you give, under the layer it's actually giving a REST API to this server that is listening on the host side of it. And essentially, if you look in this case, you know, we're saying HTTP localhost, host and port, assuming port is 80 in this case, containers slash Mongo slash stats. That's sort of the API that is being issued behind the scenes for you. We're just directly tapping into the API itself. And other part that you want to be a little bit aware here is how the API can be accessed using on a Mac. And if you're using Windows, there's a lot of flavors on Windows that you can use. So I blogged about this a couple of days back. If you want to access the Docker remote API, go to my blog and read about how, how much fun you can have when you're using Docker on Windows. Cool. Actually, you should check Arun's blog frequently because he's blogging a lot of cool stuff about Docker and Java. Thank you. I read it every time, so. Um, if you're running, especially if you run Swarm, this is another command that you can use. So Docker service logs, and then you can see what's happening with your services in there. And this is very powerful as well, because if you are running, if you're scaling your service, you know, you don't know where those containers are going to be running, which host they're going to be running. And it's very difficult for you to figure out. I mean, well, you can find out, but this Docker service logs is an aggregated command where it actually starts giving you data. So as you're seeing here, for example, it'll start listing the actual instance where the log is coming from. That, that's very handy, it's an aggregated service log. So there are third part tools that you can use as well. For example, uh, Prometheus, you can uh, connect to, this is new in version 113. You can connect to several endpoints and have uh, information over there. There is a, a tool called C Advisor that you actually can run using Docker with those the, that command over there. And it's going to give you a nice graphic interface about what's going on inside your, your container. One of the tricky parts for C Advisor is it only gives you data for 60 seconds. So you typically have to front end it, or back end it rather, with the InfluxDB where you're storing that C Advisor data, and then front end it with a Grafana dashboard. So that's something to be, I mean, there's plenty of material on that available. So I would just say Google it, and you will find the right information. So integration testing. Um, integration testing, I think, is one of the most important uses for, for Docker, for Java developers. Because I don't know if you guys do integration testing, but it's really hard. You have, when you do integration testing, you want to do as much close to production as possible. So it's different than, uh, you don't want to start an embedded database, for example, because it's going to give a different result when you go to production. So Usually you want to have to simulate several nodes running or Hadoop cluster, for example, several nodes for your database or several databases talking to each other. This is, this is very hard. So with Docker, what you can do is to create, for example, uh, a Docker Compose file that is going 
to, to run, to be used just for testing. So why I'm going to do this? Because there are a few differences than uh, when I'm running tests than when I'm running production. First, usually I don't want to have volumes mapped so I can uh, run several builds uh, in, in parallel and when I start, I stop a build, I stop at a test, all my, da my data is gone, so it's clean for the next test. Uh, the other thing I, I want to do is I don't want to publish any ports because if I start publishing ports, I can't run two builds or two tests in parallel, right? Because I'm, I'm going to have port conflict. So usually what I do is I create a Docker Compose file that's just like the Docker Compose file I would be using for production, but without the volumes mapped and without the ports exposed. Then I'm going to run the application, and usually what happens is that you have to run a script to load data in the database, then maybe run the application multiple times to simulate several situations, and after you do that, you have to run the integration test. Which usually it's checking log files or uh, checking uh, the results in the database to, say, to see if the application run as you expected. And then you stop the services using the same Docker Compose file. And then you have a completely clean environment for the next test. Because everything was started, no volumes are mapped, so the database is going to be empty next time you run the integration test. So it's very, it's very easy. It's a lot, a lot easier than doing this by hand. So if you're not using Docker for other things, just do integration tests is worth uh, the investment. Uh, and this is a trick because if you want to run multiple uh, tests in, in parallel, usually when you have Jenkins, for, for example, and you have several builds going on, if someone starts a build and another one starts a, a similar build or uh, using the same services, what happens is that you are going to have conflict because uh, Docker is going to start the services in the same network, unless you use the p-switch over there. So to, what I'm saying over there, okay, so what I'm saying over there is that uh, Docker should start all the services in its own network. And I'm saying that the network should be called app, and I'm using here the Jenkins build number variable, but it could be anything else you want. So as soon as I do that, I have all the services isolated, and it's going to be to allow me to run several builds in parallel. So that's that's a nice trick also. So I finished. See? Bingo. All right. Well, I hope you had fun. Um, if you like the talk, we would really request you to go to the DockerCon application, rate us, give us a rating that you feel is appropriate. That hopefully brings us back again. Thank you. We'll be around for taking questions. Thank you.